everything everywhere all at once. No, I'm not talking about the Oscars. That just seems to be the scope of the Digital India Bill. On 9th March, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology held what it called a Digital India Dialogue on the Digital India Bill. IFF was present as Métis took us through a presentation which included, among other things, the need to replace the IT Act, why India needs global standard cyber laws, and components of the Digital India Bill or the Digital India Act. I'm Pratik Wagre, the Policy Director at the Internet Freedom Foundation, and I want to talk to you about why we need to pay close attention to what happened with the Digital India Act over the next few months. Only with the benefit of hindsight will we be able to truly judge whether this marks the start of a genuine consultation exercise or is merely theater. But for now, let's talk about the bill. While there is no draft version in the public domain yet, we can piece some things together based on the presentation that was made and reports in the media over the last year or so. The bill seems ambitious and appears to be extremely wide in scope. A non-exhaustive list of items or issues that it could cover include artificial intelligence, blockchain, deliberate misinformation, doxing, metaverse, advanced quantum computing, AI-based platforms, e-commerce entities, fact-checking portals, social media companies and their algorithms, catfishing, cyberbullying, gaslighting, identity theft, and so on. Now, the complexity of the task at hand cannot be understated. The services we interact with on the internet simultaneously impact areas such as competition, privacy, public discourse, mental health, and many more. The issues themselves may vary from market or governance failures, some of which can potentially be addressed through regulatory interventions, but also include deep-seated social problems coupled with manifestation of psychosocial factors further amplified by our cognitive biases. In other words, they're extremely complicated. Their effects seamlessly flow between physical and digital spaces and need to be understood in greater detail before we can wish them away just by rewriting laws. Now, elementary public policy suggests that perhaps the legislation is attempting to do too much. In the book, Missing in Action, the authors remark that trying to solve several problems with one policy in addition to the need to balance equity, efficiency, and effectiveness is a trap we should avoid. Anyway, in spite of hearing about this proposed legislation for nearly a year, we are yet to see, you know, beyond rhetoric, a clear and detailed articulation of what Métis considers are the key safety issues and harms we face on the internet today. Neither has any department within the executive detailed how they consider the current laws as being applicable to the internet, where they see the gaps, and whether these gaps are a function of framing, enforcement, or something else entirely. Merely fixing accountability on intermediaries cannot be the aim without comprehensively outlining these existing problems and supporting them with evidence. And since designing policies is effectively an exercise in making trade-offs, there also needs to be due consideration and explanation about the benefits that internet services enable, accompanied by an assessment of how they might be impacted, as well as the thought process behind the choices that were made. These are prerequisites for civil society, industry, and the government itself to even begin to estimate whether they're on the right track or just engaging in an exercise of placing the proverbial cart before the horse. Ideally, what we need the government of India to do is to seek to encourage the development of institutional capacity and independent research to understand these effects. This is imperative if India wants to position itself as a leader in all things digital in the long term. There are no shortcuts here, but in the near term, some of these gaps can be narrowed by conducting genuine public consultations in good faith. An open, trusted, and accountable process where the executive is open to feedback and course correction needs to form the basis of such ambitious legislation. Now, the executive's own track record suggests there's plenty of room for improvement, which is demonstrated by a few notable examples. Despite years of criticism on previous versions of the proposed data protection legislation by civil society, especially on matters such as exemptions for the state and the lack of independence of any data protection authority, the most recent draft has not only seemingly ignored this feedback, but also made things worse in some circumstances. Nor has it provided specific reasoning as to why certain aspects of the Data Protection Bill 2021 were retained while others were given a thumbs down. We've also seen the ministry deny right to information requests for consultation responses to the draft Indian Telecommunications Bill 2022. It went a step further with the draft Digital Personal Data Protection Bill 2022 and subsequent consultations by stating upfront that responses would not be made public. It also refused to provide information about consultation responses for amendments to the IT rules 2021 in relation to online gaming. I will say that this lack of transparency on display, citing procedural technicalities, contradicts some of the proclamations of transparency. How do we as citizens know which interest groups are saying what about matters that affect many of our rights? To its credit, 
Meti has conducted some in-person consultation meetings since 2022. Unfortunately, some past public consultation events that I have attended have sent the message that contrary views are not welcome. In what may be described as an inversion of responsibility, civil society is browbeaten, ridiculed, and expected to be precise and narrow with their asks and concerns, while the ministry gives itself tremendous leeway under the guise of experimentation. That's not how things should work. A process where citizens do not feel safe while expressing disagreement or conveying critical feedback about issues that affect their rights is sure to generate suboptimal outcomes. And any legislation born out of consultation processes that are not genuinely open, transparent, and conducted in good faith will likely end up being deficient in substance. And if that happens, how will we protect the digital and physical safety of Nagriks? At IFF, we're going to continue tracking and raising issues that affect your digital rights. If you can, please support our work by donating to us. If you already support us, please ask your family and friends to do so. You can also get involved in the conversation on our Telegram channel. All links are included in the description.